Hey everyone, thanks for sitting in on our webinar this morning. My name is Joe Kozlowitz. I'm on the Greenhouse Data Marketing Team. Today we'll be covering an overview of types of cloud services and how you can make some inroads with your customers to start selling them. Uh, just some quick housekeeping before we begin. Please feel free to ask questions at any time. Use the GoToWebinar panel. There's a chat feature or a questions area. I will collect all of them and then we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. I'm joined this morning by Brian Parsons, our Director of Channel Sales, and Erica Herring Kovacs, Strategic Partner Manager for the Midwest region with Microcorp, a leading master agent. With that, I'll go ahead and hand things off to Brian and Erica, give us a quick rundown on our companies before Brian launches into the cloud. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Hi, this is Erica, Erica Herring Kovacs from Microcorp. As as I meant, as um, they mentioned, I am the strategic partner manager for the Midwest region. Um, I've been a part of the company for a little over a year, but have been in telco for almost 15. Um, Microcorp is a 31 year old master agent based out of Atlanta, Georgia. We have our own Nautilus portal, which supports every phase of your business. So your your support, your sales, your quotes, your commissions, anything that you need, we have this portal that we developed for our partners. Um, we are also strong on our basic telco uh, providers. However, in the last two years, we've grown in the cloud, SD-WAN, data center, UCAS, and other services with, um, within our portfolio. Um, I want to thank Greenhouse Data for putting this together. I think this is a great webinar. I think this is going to be really good for the partners to learn. Um, I would love to talk deeper about Microcorp, um, but I don't want to hog up a ton of time um, away from this webinar since we only have 30 minutes. So feel free to reach out to me at 513-280-4116, and we can talk a little bit deeper on Microcorp and how we can help you. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Erica. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Brian Parsons and I am the Director of Channel Sales for Greenhouse Data. So I run the indirect channel for Greenhouse across the entire country. So just wanted to give you a little bit of a quick overview of Greenhouse Data before we start to really jump into things. Um, and, and what we'll be doing today is really having a discussion, what I like to call a very high level discussion about some different aspects of cloud computing what makes up cloud computing um, to, to really give our partners a better sense of some of the questions that they can ask and some of the things that they might be able to look for when they're going to engage their clients in a conversation around these types of services. So Greenhouse Data has been around for 10 years. We started in 2007, primarily as an infrastructure as a service provider. Um, we offer both cloud hosting and co-location services as you can see our map throughout the entire United States. Um, I think that that's one of the things that makes us a little bit different than some of the other providers that are in the market is that from a partner perspective, um, with our different cloud nodes throughout the country, we have the ability to really get closer to the customer. Um, one of the things that clients like from us is we have a 15 minute hear from a human SLA on our support. Um, when clients are looking to deploy in our cloud, one of the things that we do is a free cloud assessment to help them with evaluating what their production workload is doing, um, what it looks like, and what it's going to take for them to move into a virtual infrastructure that is then off-site. Um, we are a VMware-based cloud, and one of the key drivers of our company is sustainability. So um, we green is not just in our name it's actually one of the things that we do so um, all the power that we purchase throughout all of the sites in the country are backed by win credits so that's definitely something that's a little bit different than some of the other people in the market and now we'll kind of jump into why are we talking about cloud computing today what's the what's the big kick with this and, and why is it important to to greenhouse data and to you specifically as a partner when you're looking at your client base and how you're managing that client base. And, and I think you can see from some of the statistics here on this slide, um, cloud computing as a industry has grown substantially over the last number of years. I mean, and we're, we're really talking about an industry that started, um, you, you know, 
started to really kind of catch on back in 2009, 2010. And, and at, you know, at that point in time, I don't even know if we were calling it public cloud and private cloud. But when you look at, you know, 2017, uh, the projected growth is, you know, 18% up to a total market value of $246.8 billion. That's quite a big piece of the pie. And we just want to make sure that as, you know, business owners and partners that you're out there and you're able to grab a hold of some of that revenue that, that can be low hanging fruit for you to really engage your clients in these types of conversations. So, you know, one of the things that we look at um, as a provider is not only what we're providing for our clients, but then also what's going on in the market from a partner perspective. And when we, when we talk to a number of partners that are in the industry today, there's, there seems to be an immense, um, desire to be able to start to sell some of the types of solutions that we offer based on, you know, based on the overall revenue and different things that come with it. But we also find a lot of partners that haven't quite embraced it yet, maybe due to a uh, lack of knowledge or comfortability with, with what they're doing. And so you can see some of the statistics here. Um, and these are, you know, these are all different types of partners. They could be managed service providers. They could be traditional telecom agents, whatnot. Um, but there, there are a number of partners out there today that maybe are not um, offering infrastructure as a service type solutions to their clients. But as we can see, I think the, the overall business, um, business community is really looking to adopt some type of cloud computing. And, and that is growing, you know, year over year over year. And the, you know, the, the nice kicker for from the partner perspective is it really is a great way to add additional monthly revenue to your bottom line billing and, and grow your business. So now we're going to really just, you know, for lack of a better term, we'll kind of start to dive into the overall technology of the cloud. And I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. If you guys have any questions, please remember, feel free to put a question in the chat and I'll answer it as we go along. So if you get stopped up anywhere, just let me know. Or if you have any questions, just let me know. So when we look at you know cloud computing, and today when we talk about cloud computing, we're really talking about um, infrastructure as a service, or for you know maybe a more common term would be public cloud or private cloud type solutions. So when we stop back and we look at the beginning of where the technology industry has come from, you know we've really come from a place of physical servers that were on site. And there's a number of things that make up those physical servers. And the great part about what it actually makes up the physical server is that it's really pretty similar to what makes up a virtual server. So when we're looking at a virtual VM or virtual server that resides on a physical server, so you can have multiple virtual servers residing on one physical server, you know, it, when we started, servers were made up of CPU, RAM, you've got a NIC card, and then you have, you know, the HDD in storage, which really isn't too different than what makes up the cloud. And so what really made the cloud come to light was the evolution of softwares called hypervisors. And what the hypervisor, for lack, for lack of a better term, does is that it allows the orchestration between between multiple multiple virtual machines on one physical set of hardware. So what that environment looks like today is if you see the little diagram here, it might not be the prettiest thing in the world, but what you're looking at is you're looking at multiple CPUs, multiple sets of RAM, and multiple sets of storage that all reside in, in kind of one area there. And then you have, you know, the, the I'd say the, the primary hypervisors that are used today for, for your enterprise clients, um, if you look at, an, at, at really any enterprise that is virtualized, they're going to be virtualized um, more times than not. They might be doing it on site, and about 80% to 90% of the market is using VMware when they're doing that. And then you have different types of hypervisors, that the XN or Hyper-V, which is obviously associated with the Microsoft solution. Um, I believe, you know, OpenStack is another one that's out there. So there's a number of different hypervisors that are out there. For instance, we chose VMware because it, for us, it integrated a little bit more closely 
with the enterprise market, what people were already doing today, so that the jump from what they were doing today on site to moving to a provider like ourselves or into the cloud was a little bit easier for them to translate. So you can look at it, you know, the virtual machine, we've got the application, the operating system, and then the different components that actually make up that virtual machine. You know, the CPU, the RAM, the network interface card, and then the storage. And here's kind of, here's a slide. It's a very, you know, I'll call it like a very high level overview of what the cloud kind of looks like on the back end of, of things. So, so if you were going to visualize this today, what you would look at is at the bottom of the slide there where we have the VMware ESX, that's actually the cloud host. So that's the physical server that's sitting in one of our data centers that then has multiple VMs that run on that. So every single different app and operating system, for lack of a better term in this slide, would kind of look like a different virtual machine. And then we tie that into our storage gear which we use the EMC VDX storage platform that allows for multi-tiered storage. But those are the main, you know, those are the main components to make up the server and the storage side. And then you move into, you have switches and firewalls that help orchestrate, you know, putting multiple physical hosts together and building an N plus one or N plus two cluster that really kind of makes the cloud go. So that that's from a very high level overview, kind of what the, what the cloud would look like if we were looking at it from a physical standpoint, then, then trying to visualize that and going into more of a virtual stand, standpoint. But as you can see there, you know, the components, why they're different, they're not totally different. So if you can start to grasp some of the concepts of, hey, we have virtual CPU, we have RAM, we have storage, and we have an operating system, you just really, in those, four components have started to grasp what starts to make up a cloud computing um, VM. So th there's obviously there's a lot more that can go into it and it can get a lot more complicated, but let's, you know, let's really kind of keep this at an easy level. And I think if you can start to grasp those concepts, it will help you in uncovering some of those opportunities with your clients and being able to, to talk intelligently to them about what you're doing and, and and how you can help them find find a good home for their workload. So really what we're, we're talking about here is, you know, when we look at the market today, um, my boss says it, and if for lack of a better term, we'll, we'll call it, we, you know, Joe was politically correct when you put the cloud flavors on here. We we'll, Sometimes we like to call it the asses. And, and it's something that we see in the market today that everybody has something as a service. So when we talk about what what we do maybe at Greenhouse Data, it is really it's infrastructure as a service, and that can equate to pub, public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud type solutions, um, which which you know that really makes it up. So you're talking about pure compute resources, and that's really just you know no different than taking taking those virtual machines that they may be or managing on site and then putting it in an offsite field. And like I mentioned, what really starts to make that up is you've got the virtual CPU, the virtual RAM or memory, the storage, and of course the bandwidth that gets tied on to these things. And then the operating system. Um, and then the way to, to, the way to look at it very often is it's, it's in, in more than one way, it's almost access the same as a normal server that sits on site. So you still have that local LAN that's sitting there. The one difference that comes into play is that you've also, you're also creating a WAN out there to connect that virtual server that's sitting in our cloud back to that company's headquarters or distributed to their multi-locations that may be throughout the country. And, and this is all done via a managed web portal or desktop app. So then we look at another as a service. So there's a lot of confusion. We start to talk about platform as a service. And I, I get this question quite a bit. It's like, Brian, what the heck is platform as a service? And so what we're looking at with platform as a service, it's, it's basically like a infrastructure service, but it's really built for more of a specific reason. So you look at like an Oracle database cloud, 
that's a platform as a service, or Java Runtime, that could be a platform as a service. And we find it's used quite often for maybe like software development, some of those types of things. Um, software as a service, I think a lot of us will be um, pretty apt to understand what software as a service. The, the easiest one that I find is like salesforce.com. Um, that's a software as a service. And basically what it is, is they've built their own infrastructure that sits some, somewhere else and it is and it is basically hosted somewhere else, but the the client actually accesses that through a, through a website. Um, hosted QuickBooks is another one that we see for a lot of partners um, when they're talking about that. And and sometimes their clients experience issues with that because you know they're not getting quite the service they want through hosted QuickBooks through software as a service. So sometimes it makes sense for them to take that QuickBook license and put it in an infrastructure as a service. Um, backup as a service. So this is one of the solutions that we offer as an infrastructure as a service provider. Um, backup as a service. And basically what it's doing is it's allowing a client to build a custom RPO, RTO type of, type of scenario. And it really can come into play when you have those clients that, that maybe they have storage gear that's on site today or they're doing tape backups or something along those lines. They're looking to take that to the next level or they found that, hey, we're running, you know, running out of space in our storage here, guys. What are we going to do? And then we look at disaster recovery as a service, somewhat similar to the backup as a service, except when you look at the RPO, RTOs for disaster recovery as a service, in essence, what you're able to do is you're able to build a real-time disaster recovery site without the client having to go out and procure more equipment to make that possible. And that's really one of the great drivers with disaster recovery as a service. Um, you know, and, and that along with the very low RTO times that, that you can look at. And then one of the last of, of the as a service here that we'll talk about is another service that we, we also offer here is a desktop as a service. I like to call it desktop as a service slash VDI. And what that is, is in essence, it's virtual desktops that can be distributed out to a large number of users for an organization that gives them access to the corporate re resources that are residing on those corporate servers. Um, and, in essence, it's another way to connect back to, to the mothership without some of the um, trials and tribulations of building IPsec VPN tunnels for all their clients that work out in the field or for those clients that really have a high level of security that for the information that their road warriors have on their on their laptops. That's kind of where we've seen a lot of the um, drive towards desktop as a service. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the public versus the private versus the hybrid type cloud situation. So when we look at it, public and private clouds, in essence, they are somewhat similar, but they're also different. So what makes them up is an ask, it is really the same, it's the same infrastructure built out the same way. But what's different about a public versus a private cloud infrastructure is that, we'll get the clouds, get them to catch up here a little bit. Um, with, with a public cloud infrastructure, you might have multiple tenants, multiple clients that are all residing on the same type of hardware, right? So you have multiple workloads that are all there. There's enough room for them. They're they're secure. They're all encrypted between the different environments, those types of things. And then when we look at the private cloud environment, what that really is built for is you have dedicated hardware infrastructure that then has virtualization tied into it for a single client. And what we what we do is what we find is that there are some instances where it makes sense for a public cloud workload, and some instances it makes sense for a private cloud workload. And then you get those clients that kind of sit in the middle, and some of their workload makes a lot more sense to put in a public cloud, and some of their workload makes a lot more sense to put in a private cloud. And some of the things that go with that and can kind of help you drive that direction. Now, obviously, that's where our solution architects will get involved and they'll dive into what the client's doing, what their workloads look like, all those types of things. Um, 
but that's where that's where really the technical guys really like to come into play and can and can help partner with you to find those things out from your clients. So now what I'd like to do is just kind of we'll walk through a little bit of information about selling infrastructure as a service. Um, and some of the questions and things that you might want to be looking for when you're out in the market and talking to your clients. Um, one of the things that we see happen quite a bit is when clients are looking at, you know, expanding their bandwidth, maybe they're going, you know, they're talking to you today and they have a 10 meg circuit and they come back and they say, hey, I think we really want to look at a 100 meg circuit. It, it can very often lead that there's another project on the back end of that that is actually driving that consumption for bandwidth. And that can be them looking to move their assets or their production workload off site. Um, as we start to look at, you know, modernization and, and migration, one, you know, one aspect that we see is, you know, the, the third bullet point down there is, you know, those clients that you're talking to that are coming up on an equipment refresh within the next 12 months and whether they're looking at that model of taking those CapEx expenditures and then moving them more into an OPEX expenditure. So instead of them going and buying servers, you know, for a workload that they have today, and then they're not really buying servers for that workload, they're really buying, try, looking to try to buy servers for the workload that they're gonna have three to five years from now. Instead of going that direction, they can look at moving to an OPEX model, buy what they need today, and then as they grow, they can grow into it. Um, you know, new, new versions of application developments. Um, obviously, one of the things that, that can drive a cloud deployment is when a client has their production work, workload on site and they've experienced power outages, they're running out of space, they can no longer cool their, their closet that they have in the back. Those are all things that can really start to drive clients towards a cloud deployment. Um, compliance, so obviously compliance is another big driver for people to actually consider moving to the cloud. HIPAA compliance, um, SOC compliance, PCI compliance. And the reason it can drive them is that when you look at compliance as an overall driver, um, our public cloud is HIPAA compliant. We can build our private clouds to be HIPAA compliant. Um, those clients that are looking, you know, looking to have to fit within those realms of compliance, they often want to work with a provider that can help them do those things. And like I mentioned before, that CapEx, the OpEx, but like legacy infrastructure, when they're looking at the life cycle purchase of their equipment and kind of what they're looking for. Um, we'll kind of run through some of these things. Security. Security can be a big driver for people to consider moving to the cloud. And you might say, well, wait a second, security, why is that really a driver? Well, you have to take into consideration that as a infrastructure as a service provider, and this isn't just us, this, you know, this is going to be the majority of people out in the market. Security is a big part of what we do for our clouds because we're protecting our information and our infrastructure just as much as those clients want to protect theirs. And so there's other services that you can add on when we start to look at like penetration testing, we can manage firewalls or they can manage firewalls. Um, there's a lot of different things that go into it. Um, you know, data integrity. One of the things that we're talking about, like when we're looking at the backup as a service or disaster recovery as a service, um, the backup as a service is those clients you're talking to ties right back into compliance, but they need to keep their information and they need to keep it for extended periods of time. How do they do that? One of the ways is they have to buy expensive storage gear to do it. The other ways that they can go about that is they can leverage an infrastructure as a service provider, utilize the expense that we've already put out for our storage gear and then have access to all that type of equipment. And then of course, disaster recovery as a service. I think this is a big driver for partners in the market today to really kind of get the door open for some of their clients that maybe have not moved to the cloud or they're, you know, because when we look at the traditional enterprise today, most of them are virtualized to some extent on their premise or maybe even in a cloud. But the disaster recovery as a service solution allows them to build a real-time disaster recovery plan, um, just like I mentioned earlier, without having to procure additional equipment or data, excuse me, data center space to do it. Um, data archival, if you have clients that have large amounts of data that they're trying to back up, um, and this could be multiple terabytes up to petabytes of data, this is where a provider like us can come into play 
utilizing our object-based S3 storage platform. It's what we like to call kind of our cheap and deep platform. But it's a it's a great way to get start to get those wheels thinking in your head of, hey, if I have a client and they're struggling with what they're doing from a storage perspective and they mention that to you during a discovery call, that could be a good time for you to potentially reach out to to Erica, a provider like ourselves, and us to be able to help you out with, with what that client's doing. You know, and when we look at the cloud, there's, you know, some of the ways we like to, to describe it just from a high level, you know, flexibility and agility, because you can, you can spin VMs up, you can spin them down, you can make them larger or smaller based off of what that workload looks like. And you can do that in a real time basis. And that goes to like the flexibility and agility, higher performance. We've talked about the capital expense versus the operational expense. Um, we've talked about the security in terms of that cloud providers are really working on the security on a day-to-day -day basis, the compliancy that comes in to play, and then sometimes the low cost. And, and the low cost will come into play with the scalability that's actually built in to the platform that we've built out from an infrastructure standpoint. It allows the clients to scale their workload as they need it as opposed to buying more than they need today, which can inevitably cut down their costs. And, and I'll add one more in there that, that actually we didn't list in this, but, but manpower can also be a big one. Um, because you have to realize from an IT perspective, your clients often will have times where they have people that are managing that hardware on site. That takes time away from them being able to accomplish other tasks for their clients, and their clients would be the employees of that company. So one of the things to think about is like, hey, how do, you know, how do we start to lead customers to the cloud? You know, be proactive, ask them what they're doing from a cloud perspective. If they have any strategies that are coming up in the next, you know, next 12 months, six months, anything along those lines. And, and then realize that you have a partner that's out there that can help you with these things. Uh, the goal here today is not for you to become an ultimate expert in cloud computing and all those things. And, and quite honestly, I sell this stuff and I wouldn't call myself an expert in it. But that's why we really leverage the technical resources that we have at Greenhouse Data to be able to accomplish these types of things. Questions that, some questions to ask. What is the hosted, I, you know, what is in the IT environment? How many resources are you currently in use? How are your records being soar, stored? You know, I often ask clients, what does your disaster recovery plan look like? And that'll get them talking to who knows when, um, you know, and then you can always look at where where is everything currently hosted and what are the capabilities of that infrastructure, meaning the redundancies and everything that's been put into place. And if they're lacking in those types of redundancies, that's when it could make sense for them to look at a cloud provider like ourselves. Here's some more questions that we can look to ask, you know. How would the loss of some or all of your data affect your daily operations? And what would an ex unexpected downtime impact your daily business operations? You know, th these are all good questions that you can lead in with your client and then know that you have a partner that can help support, support these types of things. And so we're going to finish up real quick. Sorry, I'm running just a tad bit over, guys. So you might ask, hey, why do we, why do we want to look into selling cloud solutions or infrastructure as a service solution? And I think for all of this, it, it comes down to a compensation potential. Um, when we look at, you know, first being able to diversify your book of business. If you're traditionally selling network type services, the ability to diversify your book of business into, you know, UCAS type services, infrastructure as a service type services, really can help you in the long run. It makes your clients more sticky and really starts to take you up in the ladder of being a, a, a trusted consultant for your client. I think, you know, anybody that's been in the telecommunications market over the last 10 years has seen what the pricing for network connectivity has done. So what that does to you, if you're out selling those types of services, it means you have to sell more services to more different clients to get to where you want to go. Um, one of the things that I know, you know, that, that you could see in selling connectivity can be that you are really shouldering a lot of the internal work to make that sale happen. And when you're partnering with an infrastructure as a service solution provider, that's something that's a different model in how we work with our partners and that we truly are and try to be a partner to you, meaning that 
once an opportunity is registered with us, we can give you as much or really as little type of support from a technical solution engineering side as you look for. So like I mentioned earlier, I typically don't have the detailed technical conversations with the client. That's where I bring our solution architecture team in and they have those conversations with the clients because they're able to better relate and walk them through the process of what's going on and what needs to happen. Um, and then let's, let's take a quick look at what average cloud deals look like for, for a provider like us. And, and when, I, when I want you to look at these numbers, one of the things I want you to take away is, as a provider, we help clients of all different sizes. So I, I literally have clients that have one virtual machine with me that I've sold through partners. And we help those clients out the same way that we help out the large organizations. But, you know, if you have a small deal, that deal typically ranges about $1,500 per month in MRR. And I know that that's not really probably blowing anybody's socks off, but when you start to get into the average size deal, so that small mid enterprise size company, and when they start to look at what they're doing with their infrastructure, those deals typically range in between anywhere from 15 to $20,000 a month in MRR. And I can tell you, it doesn't take a long time for them to get there. Um, and it's, and it's one of these types of solutions that when you sell an initial environment to a client, they typically will grow over time. Part of the reason that our company grows the way that it does is that one, we have new sales coming in, and then two, our clients tend to grow with us, and they, can, they utilize more and more of our resources as time goes on. Great thing from a partner is you still get compensated. As that client grows with us, you get compensated on that growth. And then the, the other side is obviously we work on a number of different whales that are out there that, that you get into uh, where you're talking, you know, $50,000 plus. You know, I think last year I worked on at least a couple of deals that there were over $100,000 a month in MRR when we're still working on to try to get over the finish line. But those can be a real game changer for somebody's business if you happen to stumble, you know, get into one of those types of opportunities. And, and the real thing is, is, Sometimes it's an organization that, that is, they don't have to be huge organizations sometimes for them to require this type of resource. Um, and then last couple of slides here, just a high level overview of from Greenhouse Data's perspective, some of the services that we offer to our clients that, that I mentioned as we went through. So, you know, you've got the public cloud, private cloud solutions, um, disaster recovery as a service, security as a service, backup as a service. Uh, the desktop is a service slash VDI solution, and of course, um, storage platforms. So, you know, traditional storage platforms as well as object-based S3 compatible storage. So guys, I really appreciate you all um, taking the time with us today. Here is the contact information for both myself and Erica. If you have any questions that pertains to infrastructure as a service, please feel free to reach out to me. If you have any questions pertaining to Microcorp and how they help their partners really diversify their book of business um, in terms of network, UCAS, uh, data center, cloud type computing, please reach out to Erica. She's a great resource for you to have to help you kind of navigate some of those waters and find your way through some of the things that, that you might be looking at when you're talking to your clients about their challenges. Hey, Brian. I've got a hey, couple Jim. of questions that just came in over chat. Um, Okay. One was on a couple slides back there, you had mentioned average cloud deal sizes, and someone was yeah. wondering what is provided, um, I'm guessing, to the agents for these scales of cloud deals. So uh, what would be provided for the 1500 MRR versus the 15,000 to 20,000? I think we're talking about in terms of like a support perspective, and that's the, you know, that's kind of the neat thing. Like I mentioned, we truly are a partner. So you're going to get that same level of support on a $1,500 deal as you will on a fifteen dollars or $20,000 deal. And part of that goes back to, you know, like it or not, what we sell is a very intense technology-driven solution. So we have to bring in our solution architecture team and, and our technical resources to be able to deliver on what we're selling the client. So, so our process that we go through, um, it, it's a very, it's an engagement methodology where we, you know, we sit down, we talk to the client about what they're trying to accomplish, how we can help them accomplish that. 
And then we go through, we look at their production workload, like when we're talking about the free cloud assessment, where we'll look at what their servers are doing so that we can build them a solution and design them a custom solution that's gonna fit exactly what their needs are. From that point, we'll, we'll go through and we'll deliver a statement of work to that client that gives a very detailed um, out, you know, detailed overlook of like, hey, here's what your environment looks like today. Here's where we're proposing that environment go. Here's the different steps that we're gonna take to get there and the timelines that we think it's gonna take us to accomplish these things. Um, it, that, that goes through our, our pre-sales engineering team. And that also goes through our back-end engineering team as well. And that's a, that's a big difference in some of the other providers that are out of the market is that our back-end teams are vetting these solutions out um, as we go through this so that when you sell something through us, you know that it's gonna get delivered on. Thanks, Brian. Um, one other one which you did kind of touch on there was um, if I'm working with Greenhouse Data or another provider through Microcorp, who supports yeah. the customer for help desk issues? So from, from a help desk issue perspective, we will absolutely support that customer 100%. Um, when you're working through a company like Microcorp, um, they obviously they have a great back-end support and we can work with their back-end support to help make the whole world go around um, but just know that your customer is not out on the island we're going to help support them a hundred percent of the way from the beginning to the migration all the way to the delivery of that product and, and then the ongoing use of their of their infrastructure with us great that's all I have for now. If anyone else has questions, reach out directly to Brian or Erica. Um, they can put you um, on the right track. And um, I'll also send out a recording of this webinar. So thanks again for attending. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Really appreciate the time today, guys.